this this question's for their, I mean, for all of there, but, but to the doctors. How, what do you recommend to address uh, reducing visceral fat, which is, uh, and turn for uh, Dr. Finney, for example, talking about, is there an appropriate role for fasting to reduce and eliminate visceral fat in the body since there's so much relation between visceral fat and diabetes and other chronic illnesses? Uh, so there is, um, there's no perfect separation between mobilization of subcutaneous fat and visceral fat, that when someone's in negative energy balance, both are, multi are, are mobilized. Um, uh, there is, there are some claims that a high insulin level uh, tends to protect visceral fat. Um, so, you know, uh, the better one adheres to a, a, a reduced carbohydrate intake with lower insulin levels is more likely to mobilize visceral fat. Probably one of the better studies recently published that demonstrates mobilization of visceral fat was a study done by Jeff Volick at Ohio State University uh, where he recruited a group of students who were in the ROTC program, the Reserve Officer Training Program, and they have a problem that when students leave home and no longer have their mother telling them what to eat and they can eat what they want on campus, they gain weight. And that's kind of uh, antithetical to uh, having officer quality material when they graduate. So they, they signed up 15 of these ROTC students and had them follow a ketogenic diet for three months during aggressive physical training. And they actually made the, on campus, they actually were able to maintain the ketogenic diet with documented by finger stick glucose measurements. And they mobilized uh, seven kilograms of total, I'm sorry, six kilograms of total body fat, and about 10% of that came from the visceral pool, which is less than 10% of the body fat content. And they did that not by DEXA, but by MRI. Uh, so that's one example of uh, a somewhat greater accelerate, accelerated rate of um, visceral fat mobilization in the context of a ketogenic diet. But it didn't melt away, it just mobilized a little bit faster. So it, it's, uh, it's my belief and it's been my experience in my clinical practice that uh, the human body wants to get rid of the most dangerous thing first, much like we metabolize alcohol first before we metabolize other things. Uh, and it, when, when someone's following a, a ketogenic diet, well formulated, and implementing some intermittent fasting, I tend to see uh, central adipose tissue disappear first, uh, preferentially the fat, the adipose tissue that's been deposited in the liver and the pancreas. Those seem to be the first uh, deposits to leave. And so I think keeping the insulin very, very low is very important. Uh, but, but that combination of keto carnivore plus some degree of intermittent fasting, uh, and, and I love Dr. Penny's t talk. I think that uh, in my experience, I don't use anything longer than a, than a 48 hour fast in my clinical practice. I'm not against it, I just, I, I, it makes me uncomfortable after that point because I just don't think there's research to support it yet. Uh, but, but keto and intermittent fasting, I, I've not found anything in my 20 years of clinical practice that gets rid of central adiposity faster and visceral fat. If I can just add to that question. Um, first of all, the very simple answer is don't eat carbohydrates. <laughs> the second more sophisticated answer, and I just gave a talk to the Lipedema Society of America about this, is that both genetically and hormonally, there are certain distributions of fat. Lipedema is a disease where, or a genetic condition, where women in particular, but men in their 40s and 50s, collect the fat in their thighs and their buttocks. Gary's, uh, your one book showed that uh, African, the Bushman woman with the big buttocks. Uh, a camel, for example, genetically preserves its fat in its hump, and the one hump, two hump camel, and that is a genetically predetermined thing. But when a camel crosses the Sahara Desert and it loses that fat, the starvation that Steve was talking about, the hump goes away because their spine's flat. Uh, exactly the same thing with lipedema patients is the last reservoir of fat that you will preserve is that little bit up at the hip over here. And I believe that visceral fat is probably a testosterone effect, at least the association with males collecting like I do, uh, fat on the inside of our bellies. And it's the last most stubborn parts of fat that we see disappear. 
but ultimately, either through the intermittent fasting, and like um, Ken, I'm not a huge um, long-term faster, but certainly no carbohydrates, no fat. And the question I'll ask Steve Finney if, for a second, if I can interject, is this. And I'll ask Gary this as well, and I'll ask the rest of the panel. Have you ever found a person who became obese without eating carbohydrates? In other words, any, is there any other cause of obesity other than carbohydrates? And in my life, I've never found that person. No. <laughs> really hurts me, but I'll agree with Ken. <laughs> no. I'm just going <clears> to <throat> say that's a tough question because in this country, well, in the world, how would anyone not eat carbohydrates? So you've got an association between obesity and carbohydrate consumption just by virtue of the fact that you've got an association with being human and carbohydrate consumption. <laughs> um, the, uh, there are clearly genetic uh, and uh, endocrinological phenomena that will cause excess fat accumulation. Well, can they be triggered in a carbohydrate-free uh, world? And the answer is, I don't know, because we don't live in that world, so. so when I, when I, just the, the, the thyroid question, when I tell, what I tell my patients is silly answer, oh, it's my thyroid that made me fat. If you've got DVD or video evidence of little hands coming out of your neck and picking up cake and putting it in your mouth, <laughs> then we'll blame your thyroid. Until that time, I've yet to see that person. So. I'm fascinated by... Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're just... Just, just from the journalist here, there ha I'm not aware, actually, of any experiments where they have made people obese. Um, what we have is an association, it, which is not causation, <laughs> between massively increased carbohydrate consumption in the United States on the order of 30% since 1970 and the explosion of the obesity and diabetes epidemics. But... There are other things that change during that time that, um, that are possible, that possibly fuel the effect of insulin or the effect of carbohydrates. And I think we just have to keep our minds open to that. Like there's, you know, the effect of polyunsaturated vegetable oils, especially when heated, for example, which uh, break down cell membra membrane functionality, increase inflammation. So I would just say we don't have absolute proof that carbohydrates cause obesity. What we have is a great deal of proof showing that if you reduce carbohydrates, you can reverse obesity better than any other solution. But it is also true that when people in carbohydrate-reduced diets also tend to reduce their vegetable oils because they're, they're moving over to real foods and, you know, uh, um, bleach deodorized, winterized, degummified vegetable oils is not considered a whole real food uh, in the low carb community generally. So that's just from a journalist. And just to add a little spice on the panel. <laughs> the, it's impossible to do the human study, but my understanding of rodent studies that in adlibatum feeding, unless they have a genetically uh, mutation that you can whenever you let them feed them on just protein and fat chow mixes, that they don't get fat. So it's that introduction of carbohydrate and high carbohydrate that allows you to make obese mice. Um, but I think I've seen one study, and I'm dragging through the memory, that, but they were, they were genetically modified obese mice, you know, whichever group that is, uh, that feeding them fat and protein, they did get fat. But that's the only thing, and it's a dim, dark memory, and it's not human and it's not an association study. Hello, I have a question regarding fasting um, for fin Dr. Finney. Uh, are you aware of Dr. Longo's work at USC with pro um, the fasting mimicking diet, which is the five days, uh, five days of fasting? And I was just, I know that he um, makes the claims that you can lose the visceral fat faster on that uh, while preserving lean body mass and elevating um, the basal metabolic rate. And I was just wondering if you're aware of the claims that he's making regarding the fasting mimicking diet. Yes, I am. And any, <laughs> any opinions on it? Do you, do you agree with his findings or? Uh, I live in a glass house, and that means I am reticent to throw stones. Um, 
but, <laughs> but, 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 but just, 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 it's a fasting mimicking diet. It's not fasting. And uh, the uh, changes in resting metabolic rate really have to be done under rigorous metabolic work conditions. Um, and then the other thing is the data has to be done in humans. And a fair amount of that data is not, the, the, the supporting data is, is done in, in rodents, not in humans. Uh, so I, I see it as a work in progress, and I, I'd love to, to see um, I, I improved sharp tools to help us turn back this, this tide of disease. I'm leaving the country in the next couple of days. <laughs> Without mentioning names, but you mentioned a name, and longevity studies and the Garden of Eden diet and the backing of certain people and groups that have a significant interest in longevity because Christ will not return until we've all been made aware of veganism and the Garden of Eden diet and he's not coming back. Everyone in that religious group is looking for longevity. I'm just using the words longevity a couple of times over there. So most of the work of that group are about longevity and watch very carefully where that information is being backed from. This is the same concern that now produces a fasting bar. Is that correct? Yeah. Let me say that again, a fasting bar. Yeah, it's a bar that you eat so that you can fast. So I'm just going to I'm just going to leave that right there. I thought it was a, like a, I thought it was a nightclub you could go to and not eat or drink it. Another million dollar idea right there. Do you not Do you not know that there's actually a book from the 50s I think called The Drinking Man's Diet where I think you just drink that's what you do. <laughs> I think here's my, here's my take on, on fasting. Um, I'll use it for a day, I won't use it after a day. The clash is this, um, and most people I think here have heard me speak, my wheelhouse is somewhat different than the science. Steve Finney gave brilliant science about the harm that long-term fasting beyond 24 hours or intermediate fasting like that causes to the human body. And my wheelhouse is emotion. My patients who do use longer, emotion, uh, uh, longer fasts than 24 hours find tremendous emotional benefit. They, mo they find emotional buoyancy from doing that, and I give them all the credit in the world. I find that to be an emotional liability to go without eating for longer than 24 hours, so I personally don't do it. So you can't just take the, it in the context of science. You've got to take it in the context of humanity. The second comment I make to my patients is this, that before winter, Human beings intentionally used to, and animals, squirrels and that kind of thing, intentionally become insulin resistant to gain weight for the winter. So they'll actually kind of harm their bodies to gain enough winter, uh, uh, fat for winter, eating excessively in the, in, the, in the fall. Well, exactly the same way, short periods of intermittent fasting, even though scientifically, as Steve pointed out, it may harm you for a short term, if you believe psychologically and, and nutritionally there's longer term benefit to you, go for it. But I, I really don't think that anything longer than about five to seven days, call that number, but the 20, 30 days, that is permanent harm, as Steve also showed. And I think we really have to counter against that. So I'm opposed to that. Um, I'm not worried about the shorter term fast. Thank you, guys. Um, this is directed for Dr. Finney, your presentation for the prolonged fasting, in particular the lean body mass loss. Has there been any studies, and this can be everybody, um, for the type of fiber content that degrades faster, type 1, type 2B, any of that? Has that been studied at all? Or is it just generic, hey, lean body mass goes away? Or do they degrade at different rates? Uh, those fasting studies were done before Bergstrom invented the side-cutting needle to do muscle biopsies, um, which was, anyway, um, in terms of which muscle fiber type loses, I think what, what's more important is which other subfractions within muscle, such, you know, other than myofibular protein, such as mitochondrial proteins, and again, there's more mitochondria in, in slow-twitch type 1 fibers, and so you're the impediment of, of uh, oxidative metabolism in the muscle may be uh, impaired more in the early phase. 
but that's the guess. Can I sort of add a layer of question to that? When you fast or you and you or you exercise to the extreme and you burn your glycogen down and then you turn to protein, your plasma proteins go and then it's muscle. I have a theory and I've been bouncing it around for a few years and as, as honoured a panel, as esteemed a panel as we've got here. Is there damage to skeletal muscle at the same rate or is there damage to cardiac muscle as there is to skeletal muscle? Because there's a very high rate of cardiac arrhythmias within elite sports people. Now whether or not it's an atrial scarring or it's a cardiac muscle or... In theory, it's the same, it's a similar muscle. It has a slightly different, more anaerobic metabolism and cardiac muscle to aerobic and skeletal. But, you know, you've done some, I mean, you're up to date on the fasting thing. And so prolonged fasting, where you are going to break down muscle at some point in time, is it breaking down cardiac muscle as well as skeletal muscle? Uh, to my knowledge, it has not been studied prospectively, but opportunistically, sadly, when the people who uh, experience sudden death with a liquid protein diet, um, when they did autopsies on these obese patients who had uh, followed this extreme uh, uh, fat-free virtually mineral-free diet for three months or longer. Uh, they noted marked thinning of, of, of both the left and right ventricular walls. So it wasn't just skeletal muscle, but, but cardiac muscle was also wasted. But that was not just in, the, in inadequate protein intake, but because of uh, concurrent with inadequate magnesium and potassium intake as well. So it's a soft potential. We just need to do more cardiac muscle biopsy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first I just want to say this is my first conference like this, and you guys are amazing. I'm so inspired, and thank you so much for coming and talking to us. I have a very weird question. I don't know if it has any place at all, but the pancreas is responsible for the insulin, right? And so is there any studies that show overuse of the pancreas leading to pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer? Uh, I, can... I know, know of a study where it, that showed that the infusion of vegetable oils led to pancreatitis, but it's just one study. Um, and it was heated oils that led to pancreatitis. But it may have been, it may not be the normal mechanism, but it was one, it was one, they were able to induce pancreatitis. Okay, and I, oh, go ahead. All you can say is association studies are that if you've got a low fat diet over a long period of time, then as I referred to in my talk, you've got cholestasis, you actually don't have your gallbladder emptying. So that's going to increase your risk of gallstones, they can slip into the biliary tree and then you cause of pancreatitis. If you then slip into the same situation where you've got um, obesity, you've got metabolic syndrome, you've got hyperinsulinemia, insulin is a growth factor for cancer. So there's the association of hyperinsulinemia with all cancer, of which pancreatic cancer is one of them. Uh, chronic inflammation is a cause of cancer. And therefore, it's all tied up and it's going to be association. Can we prove it? No. If you throw in the polyunsaturated oils, that the, creates the perfect storm for cancer. So I don't think we'll ever be able to prove it. But by association, they all tend to overlap with each other. Thank you. Um, in relation to fasting, um, for anybody that's still in the San Diego era, era um, at Balboa Park, they actually have an exhibit at the Museum of Man on cannibalism and its history and its relation to historic periods of starvation that for historical data sets is very interesting in the context of this conversation. I'm curious amongst the panel what your various views are in terms of at what point in the um, human lifespan would you start to think that starting to get a body optimized towards persistent states of ketosis 
being important to prevent long-term damage, around what decade of life would you be really looking to start adopting consistent ketosis states? In the fetus at around three to four weeks. <laughs> and the biology behind that is that's when the fetal liver forms and the fetus is able to produce insulin around six to eight weeks. So you de the fetus is glucose dependent, well actually it's not a fetus, it's an embryo, is um, glucose dependent until the liver forms. And as the liver and the pancreas form, you are able to produce um, insulin which modulates that glucose and you can switch on the ketones. But the third trimester is really where that fetus becomes ketotic. Humans are, are unique in terms of requiring fat, subcutaneous fat to live off because our brains require so much energy we can't consume enough sugar in breast milk or from the placenta uh, later on. To, um, we have to use internal ketones. And the problem with diabetic babies is when they switch that off, that's when they become floppy and their brains don't grow and develop properly. I don't, I don't want to sound like the religious zealot, but from a historical point of view, all religions have observed fasting at some point in time. And so theoretically, fasting at a practical level is probably in teenagers, is whether or not it's in Ramadan or whether or not it's in Christianity, when you don't have kids running around starving, carb loaded. So I think I'm completely agreeing biochemically, but we as a society have adopted this practice for some thousands of years of putting it in practicality, probably in those early teenage years. So it's just, that's, that's got that's nothing biochemical, that's what we've adopted as societies. Similar question, would be there a point in the lifespan where you would become less conservative about prolonged fasts? For I think terminal illness, you know, when you're about to die. <laughs> because I think up until the day before you die, there's actually a role. You may have a potential, you know, autophagy, mitophagy, which hasn't been talked about. Mitophagy, mitochondrial turnover is just as critical as autophagy. Is, you know, because I mean, there are people in their 90s who are doing intermittent fasting and getting some benefits from it who are running at least into ketosis. I've got 90-year-old people, I'm certain everyone else is aware of people in their 90s have actually decided to go low carb and improve their health and their well-being and, and they feel great and they go out there and doing things and they're managing their arthritis and their pain settling down and they're sleeping better. I might be willing to damage my metabolism to keep both my legs at some point in my lifespan. Like, you might, well, it sounded like long-term fasting, you can do some damage to some of the metabolism mechanisms, but if it prevented, never mind, I'll stop. You know, I, I think we're all in agreement that there's uh, potentially some short-term benefits, uh, there's benefits of short-term fasting. But what I'm really impressed with, Steve, is actually giving some biochemistry behind not going too long and too hard. And I think that was really useful because I've been to meetings in the last few years where people are going rah, rah, fast for longer and longer and harder and harder. And I, it, that gives me chest pain. I uh, never thought I'd have all these people together in one place to ask this question, so this is terrific. For 30 years, I've been in my classes and in my office, my patients, telling people that to say low carb or no carb is extremely misleading. Uh, because uh, I don't want them to stop eating broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and asparagus. So my question to all of you, because I'd really like to know if, if, it's, <laughs> if I'm correct or, or if some of you feel this way, when you say no carb or low carb, do you really mean uh, no, no starch, sugar, and alcohol, or are you including Brussels sprouts, asparagus, cauliflower, uh, since they are 100% carbohydrate? Yeah, and I'd love everybody's individual answers. Yeah, I think there's a, a range of the, the proper human diet, depending on your, uh, your DNA and perhaps your gut microbiome, ranging from, uh, for some people who are young and very metabolically healthy, they can get by just fine on 50 total grams a day without expressing any of the metabolic disease that we're trying to prevent. Some people need to turn down the carbohydrate intake knob down to 20 total grams a day, and that can be broccoli or Brussels sprouts. That's your choice. Uh, but, yeah, I, th I think some people can tolerate that. Now, whether it's actually helpful to them, I don't think we know that answer. But I think many people can tolerate that many carbohydrates a day with, with no uh, overt metabolic problems from it. 
Uh, do I think we need any carbohydrate in the diet to do just fine? I think we have enough car carnivores running around now that we, we have to concede. We don't need any dietary carbohydrate to not only uh, limp by, but to excel and to, to be vibrous and vigorous. Uh, you know, vigorous. I think we can do that. Um, so I think it probably depends on your, your DNA and perhaps your stage in life, perhaps your gut microbiome. So you do include those when you say no carb. How about everybody else? Well, when I say no carb, I mean no carb. Right, I understand. But if I say, you know, 20 grams total or 50 grams total, then any uh, whole real food carbohydrate that you'd like to consume that's unprocessed, I think that's probably okay for you. Okay, next. <laughs> uh, reductionism is very dangerous when applied to nutrition. There's no one single thing that works for everybody. Right. There are concerns when you eliminate... Uh, all vegetable sources from the diet, and go pure carnivore. And that is that although meat contains potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus, you have to eat a lot of meat to get the levels that you get if you add four to five servings of non-starchy vegetables per, per day to your diet. So Jeff Volek and I posted a, a piece on our blog on, on the Verta website in which we discussed adequate adequacies of potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus and the role of vegetables. And if you don't eat them, then you have to find it from other sources. And uh, it's it, uh, and I think that pure hunting uh, societies figured that out, and uh, uh, they had uh, practices. Uh, for instance, the Inuit, when they, uh, you know, they lived in in ice and you know, snow environments for eight months a year, and most of their food was boiled, and they were boiled in stone pots heated over seal oil lamps. If you can imagine that. And so when they, their liquid came from this broth, and they had the bones and the, the residual parts of the, the seal or the caribou in these pots, uh, and it boiled, and they put more ice in and melted it and drank that, and you know, they, they lived on bone broth. Uh, as they're, you know, they probably drank a couple liters of it per day in order to stay hydrated, and that's where the water came from. Uh, they figured that out. Um, and by the way, when they, when they boiled it long enough and they didn't eat the residual, they, that was the residual in the bottom of the pot they gave to their dogs. Um, anyway, so I, I think um, we have lost a lot of cultural knowledge from people who spent thousands of years doing that. Uh, and it's, it's not simple. Uh, and we have to respect the fact that there may be things that we don't understand about that. And we try to touch on that in our blog post. So. You can find it if you just look at look for potassium, magnesium, finney, and volick. <laughs> you put those together, you'll find the blog. Okay, and you've said non-starchy vegetables. You said all carbohydrates. Uh, go ahead. Well, I think Steve was very appropriate there. If you truly eat tipped tail, you're going to get everything. If you're going to eat fresh, local, seasonal, which I go on about based on culture and and environment, then if like I, I personally. Um, eating a lot more meat, but I still like my veggies. You know, it's still in my mindset, my psyche. Uh, we try and grow our own. And so where are you, where's your you know, broccoli coming from? How many chemicals are associated with it? Find it from your local markets. And I, I like the texture of having my veggies on the plate. I like the colour. You know, I've got attention deficit disorder. Ooh, there's more colour here. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually don't like my meat too red because it reminds me of work. And <laughs> so, um, but you know, I will say because I'm also playing it fairly safe. I say, look, I, meat's great. You want to eat tip to tail, but I think it's important to have vegetables and predominantly the non-starchy ones, so the above ground ones. And so that, and the other thing is, you can never be zero carb. Uh, zero carb. There's this thing called glycogen in meat, so it's never zero zero carb. It's always a little bit sneaking in. I think um, to put this into context a little bit, Gary gave a phenomenal lecture. I don't know if it was Seattle or a little while ago. I watched a lecture of yours where he talked about normal or skinny people giving dietary advice. And it is completely out of context to use who you are as a human being, um, especially if you're skinny, to a fat person. I happen to be a fat person, and no matter what this looks like, this is always fat. So for normal skinny people, you can quantify your carbohydrate consumption by a number. For a fat person, we're like alcoholics. There is no number at which we can stop. So therefore, for me, and for the advice I give my obese and my type 2 diabetic patients is, 
your goal is to get as close to zero as possible. However, the leafy green vegetables, even though they contain some carbohydrates, for some reason, I've never met a fat person who came home after a really rough day and picked out on Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I mean, it's just a reality. So, but if there are blueberries in my fridge, and a lot of the keto people say blueberries are fine, if there's a punnet of blueberries in my fridge when I get home and I've had a rough day, it's gone. Okay, <laughs> it's drive-by, it's drive-by eating. So we have to put that into the context of the addiction of a fat person. And I know not everybody's into that, but I've never met an obese person who wasn't a drug addict, uh, and the drug being carbohydrates. So uh, I love Gary's talk on context. Um, Zero, or, or, I, final comment about this is the worst thing we can do in nutrition is strive for a perfect number. There is no perfect number. It's got to be context. Okay. Yeah, I was going to raise this issue of context as well. When you're asking this question, the question is for whom and what's your goal? So if it's somebody who's overweight or obese, then, and as we discussed, the environmental trigger is probably carbohydrates plus X, then the, the person I'd like to refer to in this situation, uh, Anthelm uh, briat savaron in 1825 said what's necessary for people to lose weight is more or less rigid abstinence to carbohydrates. And then the question is how do you define more or less? Um, it's funny about nobody goes home and pigs out on Brussels sprouts. I used to hate Brussels sprouts, but now that I don't, that I'm carb restricted, the plate comes with food on it. The Brussels sprouts is what I eat first, right? Because it's, it's got the carbs in it. And now roasted Brussels sprouts, you know, it's like the, so, but more than anything, I think we talk about this out of context, which is, I don't think we could determine, is somebody going to live longer if they eat only the, their only carb source is a glycogen in meat, or it's the, from the, the green leafy vegetables, a cup of broccoli's got like, 20 calories of digestible carbs in it anyway. So, and it's going to be slow to digest because of the broccoli, so it's not insulinogenic. Um, what's the context? What do you want that the, the person only, only, or you? Yeah, the only context for, for me was, was that predominantly, and, and some yeah. disagree with me, which is fine, predominantly uh, it is my belief that we're trying to cut out all of the things that the body is going to turn into sugar, and the body is not going to turn those green things into sugar. It's the starchy ones. Uh, right. So that's what I wanted to see your opinions. Yeah, and and some general, of you want them all out, and some of you agree yeah. with me with the starch. It's okay. You know, we're yeah. all different. And that's what I mean. I, I think what Bob said is completely, in that sense, you know, for most people, if I was giving advice, well, when I do give advice in my books, like these foods are fattening, don't eat them. You know, but it's clearly the world is full of people who can eat them and not get fat. So for them, they're fine. Are they going to live longer if they didn't eat them? We don't know. Maybe some of them will, maybe some of them won't. Maybe they'll have less cancer, maybe they'll have less pancreatitis, who knows? We don't have that information. God doesn't give it to us. So, you know, but for somebody who the, the old-fashioned diet book doctors would use the phrase that people who fatten easily, which are many of us, you know, eventually, then more or less rigid abstinence sounds like a good idea. Stay away from the thing that's causing the problem. And if that's zero or, you know, if you, then it's a the question of sort of more or less psychologically what you can embrace. Well, I mean, I think that there's just, there's a range of carbohydrate tolerance out there. We're all talking about a continuum existing. Lean, healthy, young people can eat a lot of carbs. The more metabolically unhealthy you get, your carbohydrate intolerance increases. The amount of carbs that you can eat goes down. But that is different for people all along a continuum. And I just want to add one other thing that we haven't spoken about yet, which is that um, plants, including Brussels sprouts and, and things that seem healthy, also contain in them things like lectins and oxalates and substances that some people cannot tolerate. So that was fascinating to me, and I recommend to all of you to see Georgia Ede's lecture at the carnivore conference last um, year in Boulder when she talks about the poisons in plants and why many of the people who go carnivore are for, they, it's not because they want to, they're forced to because they cannot tolerate even, even those vegetable foods. So then they also have to be careful because that, as I think Steve aptly pointed out, you need to make sure you can't get all the nutrients you need easily from just the muscle meat. You have to eat the whole animal in order to get all the nutrients that you need. Um, 
But, you know, so I think that the range of carbohydrates goes from my kid and his Oreo cookies, who looks just fine, <laughs> all the way down to zero, you know, and, and none at all. Thank you. Just one other comment about uh, leafy green vegetables. It's how you prepare them. You know, humans don't ferment. Cows do. That's how they extract the sugar. If you ferment your carbohydrates, if you juice, if you do crap like that, you're going to extract the carbohydrates, which our intestine has lost the genetic capacity to do or the evolutionary capacity to do. So it's how we transform those vegetables that also increases the extraction of the sugar. Thank you. And as I stand here in line, I realize that I really know what I want your answer to be so that if you don't give it, I probably am qualified to be a nutrition researcher because um, I'll just ignore it. But I have a personal reason for this question, and I hope I put it in the right terms. If you could say one, um, correct me if I'm wrong, one blood marker, one test marker, one, one test, one physiological thing that people hang their hat on that is way out of proportion in the anxiety level in relation to its actual value. Could you say what that would be? LDLC. Oh, I see, I like that, excellent. Yeah, LDLC, total cholesterol, yeah, I don't, they're meaningless, but so many people will have anxiety and panic attacks because theirs is high and their doctor attacked them for it. Scales. Oh. <laughs> But well, although since, I was actually since looking since for I a preempted on the LDL, I'll say saturated fat. Okay. Because we've had people who are so afraid of saturated fat that they do themselves harm by trying to eat, quote, healthy fats, polyunsaturates, which, as Nina has so brilliantly pointed out, are probably one of the hidden, hidden in plain sight toxins in, in our whole food supply. Uh, this is not a Gary fan club, but um, when last did you test your blood work? Here's your answer. Because the, sorry, the point is that if you're going to test something, it's because you want to do something about it. And if you're already doing the best you can do, which is you're exercising a little bit, or you, I don't like that word, you're being physically active and you're eating a low carbohydrate, well formulated ketogenic <laughs> diet, <laughs> then why test your blood work? The only time I ever see a doctor is in the mirror. <laughs> Thank you very much. I can, I can now go back and, and agree with almost all of you. So thank you very much. Uh, for, for those of you that were at my talk, or for those that weren't, sorry, um, who came up with testing? You know, the, the whole concept of testing was, goes back to the, 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 um, the Flexner Report in 1910. It is how you feel... And you know, the whole laboratory testing has created this entire industry of fear. Testing the cholesterol, testing things, has created fear. And that's what the whole sickness industry is based upon. We keep a concept of fear going, oh my God, I'm going to die because of the LDL. And the talks have been here, we're all going to die. And I'd rather go sliding into third base rather than being wheeled in incontinent and dribbling. You know, <laughs> we'll fall at home, but so I'm in the wrong kind of, in, into home, home plate. Home plate? Yeah, home plate. I'd like to go sliding into home plate in a swirl of dust rather than being wheeled in there. So let's stop testing and personalising and saying, hang on, this is how I feel. Now, I've actually had my blood done with Dave this week for Dave, not for me. I have a question on fasting. Were the studies that were done in the past on patients that were obese did they have metabolic syndrome? Because if I remember when I was young, what people, obese people looked like were the metabolically healthy obese. So is there much study of true metabolic syndrome, um, what happens with fasting in that case? Since the genesis of the concept of metabolic syndrome started with um, the, the Banting lecture in 1988, uh, by uh, Reuben. Jerry Reuben, yeah, excuse me. He taught me endocrinology. <laughs> Forgot his name. Anyway, um, 
those they didn't break the subjects out in, into you know sub subgroups um, before that time. Um, so I yeah you know, I, I we we really can't reverse engineer the an, an answer to the question. Sorry. Just a little bit of context. I have a little dirty secret. I'm a bariatric surgeon. I operate on people. I chop out their stomachs. I do all those things that you guys abhor, and I'm quite comfortable doing it. But the, the reason I'm saying that is because post-operatively, uh, you're doing a sleeve, I don't do bypass. Uh, my patients are fasted for three weeks. 100% uh, of them come in to the surgery by definition with a form of metabolic syndrome, either full-blown or parts of it. And within a couple of days of that fast, certainly by six to seven days, it's gone. In fact, we, if you're a diabetic, we stop the diabetic medication typically post-operatively. We come off the antihypertensive medications. There's an incredibly powerful aspect of that fast, which is really what it is, in the context of metabolic stress. Because remember, I've cut their bodies, albeit not really badly laparoscopically. We've created trauma, we've created inflammation, and they're fasting. And we see a very, very rapid resolution of metabolic syndrome. Now, can it come back if they go back to carbohydrates? Absolutely, and that's the, the bane of bariatric surgery. But one of the reasons bariatric surgeons are so adamant about their, what they do is because of that instantaneous result. We see A1Cs come down to 4.9. We see resolution early on. It comes back. 50% of people who had diabetes and had surgery, it's back within five years. So that's why I advocate the ketogenic diet before I do any surgery on any patient and often they don't need surgery. But I have that, I see that every day in my office. So there is value to it, I just don't advocate it for people just by themselves. Hi, um, so I believe uh, health is wealth, but I, I also believe wealth is wealth. And so I, I'm looking at profit, and, and I think that's important. So you know, I'm looking at companies like Beyond Burger, and, and they're worth $14 billion, and, and that's a lot of money that they're kind of pushing back into lobbying and research and paying people to really evangelize and pushing their fake meat con concoction. And, and so you know, who do you see as accruing some of the benefits and profits of the low-carb revolution? You know, who do you think will profit, in your opinion? So, so far, we've got the fasting bar, which is kind of a... <laughs> Right, and then also the keto uh, match .com dating website. That's the two ideas I've heard so far that you might be able to monetize this space, but otherwise, uh, just eat real food. The profit, the profit for all of this goes into the hip pocket of the individual. I, mean, I say to my patients, you know, the thing that's expensive about LCHF eating real food, and it's, it is expensive, it's expensive in time. It, it takes time to go shopping. It takes time to actually have a, you know, I use, we use the term, and it's Karen's Inns, it's empty pantry, full fridge. You know, think about that, you know, taking that stuff, you take not, um, it's incredibly destabilising, as I was referring to. This is a, taking money away from the corporates and it's putting it back in the local market. It's taking, when you come off medication, it's redistributing wealth away from the corporate pharmaceutical industry, but it's putting it back in the hip pocket. Where that makes so you've got a choice with that expense of that time. You've got a choice of spending the time now preparing your food and doing and getting healthy, or you've got a choice of spending that time later in my waiting room. And that's what I call becoming a medical tourist. And you know many people who actually spend what are we doing this week, darling? Are we gonna go and have a blood test and we're gonna have an x-ray? We're gonna go and see Dr. Fetke and then he's gonna not refer you to so and so and he's gonna send you to here and gonna it, it, that's the, the expense of it all. So we've got to think about wealth, not just in dollar terms, but wealth as in time, because time is probably as much as important. And if I could just add one more thing, <clears throat> I'm a huge proponent of buy local, support local, and I think that the billions of dollars that big pharma and big food are going to lose is not going to go to you, okay? It's going to go, it's going to go back to the local farmer and the local, the local cattlemen. That's where the money's gonna go back, where it should have stayed in the first place. But that's where I think all, this, all the billions are gonna go back to the local economies that need it desperately so they can actually grow their own food in a sustainable fashion. I know that's a trigger word. And, but, but also, <laughs> that's, what, that's what needs to happen for us, for, for this entire thing. But if you love your planet, and you wanna take care of your planet, 
then you need to eat low carb. You need to eat car- keto, carnivore, because you're going to return the economy, that global multinational economy, you're going to turn it back into local, multiple thousands of little local economies, and that there's nothing more sustainable than that. Too bad we didn't meet earlier on ketomatch.com. Um, so I don't know if you're looking for a business idea or exactly what the question is, but I mean, clearly there's going to be, you know, if people really shift their eating habits, there's going to be, you know, major market shifts. Just look at the incredible success of Kerrygold butter, which has, you know, has like grown by uh, thousands of percent, because it's because you know it's been embraced by a community. There'll be more. I mean, clearly there'll be a shift in which industries do well and which don't do so well. You'll definitely see that happen. And if you look at every single packaged food item in the grocery store and just imagine a keto version of it. So there used to be, before the low-fat diet came along and the government said, USDA literally said, we need you companies to make low-fat versions of everything in the supermarket, and they did. Now there's going to need to be a keto version of that, if that's even possible. And, you know, do we believe that... Keto Doritos are really real food. I don't know, but um, but there will be a demand for all those things. So um, so I think that's a, a, an opportunity. I, 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 is this is this being is being taped? Because will it ever go live? Oh dear. Uh, Everyone, put your phones down. This is going to be good. I was helping my daughter on Flickr some time ago. You know Flickr? Yeah. Tinder, sorry, Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old. I was helping her on Tinder one day. You know, and you know, you flick left or right, you know, as to potential or not potential. This is all about your dating stuff. And I, I love her dearly because every time vegan male came up. So what I want, whoever, anyone here from Tinder, anyone got contacts, I actually want them to put a keto tag on there. Yeah, just put a keto tag on there because she'll go, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Megan. I'm not, I'm not on Tinder. I'm not on Tinder. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Do you believe that we cl- clinicians are obligated to continue statins on patients with a history of cardiac events despite normalization of all their biomarkers of disease? And if so, how long and at what dose? <laughs> so I really am not impressed with the research on statins, even in secondary prevention. And so if my patient, and so I'm, I'm a little bit uh, diplomatic about this. If my patient says, I don't know, doc, I, that makes me nervous, then I'll leave them on five milligrams of Lipitor, right? Mm-hmm. And, or real, actually five milligrams of, of Zocor because there's a generic. I think Lipitor just went generic. But, and so I'll do that just to, because I don't think that's going to harm them. I think that's, that's not a big deal, right? If they're not having symptoms and that's, that tiny dose is going to ease either their mind or their wife's or, or husband's mind or their cardiologist's mind. I'm happy to, to ease his mind as well. But I, I would counsel my patients to make their own decision, but then I would also you know, talk to them about the, uh, the research that Dr. David Diamond talks about and, and, and help them you know, maybe read Nina's book and some other resources and say, you know, it's up to you. With CoQ10? Yeah, with some CoQ10, absolutely, 100%. So, so you're recommend, recommending homeopathy. Is that what you're saying? Those are your words, not mine. You, you help your daughter on Tinder. Don't judge me. No, no. Yeah, because I know some of the flicker. guidelines flicker. are at oh, high dose. Back to Flickr now. I think there are two responses in my own practice. Um, the first thing is pretty much everybody I see, and as I said, I'm just a surgeon, um, they almost all, when you ask them a few simple questions, have significant side effects from their statins. The, one of the primary motivators for me losing my weight was a doctor put me on Nyspan, and it was the most awful side effects I'd ever had, and I said, there's got to be a better way. So if you leverage the side effects, I can help them to make the decision to come off themselves. That's the first thing. The second concern I have with statins 
you've had your heart attack, you've had your near miss, um, and the doctor says, here, the statin is going to make you better. Well, ha, 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 I'm on a statin. I can do whatever the hell I want to. The statin is going to protect me. And I see that subculture in a lot of our patients. And I, I find that very, very dangerous. So I have that discussion with them. The final piece that I talk to my patients about is if you go low carbohydrate, if you cut out the carbohydrates and increase your fat consumption, you don't need the statin anymore, just like you don't need your insulin anymore when you normalize your, your blood sugar. So I use that as a positive, but I, I can't tell my patients to stop statins. I allow them to make the decision based on the evidence. And we deprive, the majority of patients in this country are deprived of the balanced evidence. And I bet it's protective uh, to document those side effects as far as legitimizing stopping the statin too, correct? I, I don't uh, stop statins. My patients stop their own statins. Well, I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so all of my patients come to me with some degree of pain. We know that muscle pain is associated with statins. Mm -hmm. And I have that conversation with most of my patients about that there is a significant rate of muscle pain associated with this. I do ask them if they're male, particularly the women. I ask them if they're over 50 and they've had a heart attack. So, you know, the best studies about are males over the age of 50 have had a heart attack that they have, according to the pharmaceutical industry, 30% reduction of dying from another heart attack, but it's actually only 0.2, 0.3%. So I actually say to them, well, you've got muscle pain. I would like you to have a chat with your general practitioner regarding that information and having a trial off the statins. And I write to the GP, but by the time they ever get back to the GP, they've virtually all stopped it. <laughs> but I have the discussion with them a lot, because I've got to cover my, you know, myself. But I have that discussion. The other thing is an orthopedic surgeon, when patients come into hospital and they've got polypharmacy, which is another huge topic, um, and I've got to write out a chart. And most times the charts in my hospital only allow for 10 regular medications. And most times if I stack them, number 11 is on the statin, and I, uh, they can afford to have a little bit of time off it. But that's because I'm run out of ink. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm a big fan of everyone here, um, and I'm nervous because I have a technical question. I was at one of the breakouts, and I learned about short-term fasting and the role in increasing cortisol, which could um, lead to catecholamines being increased, which helps your hormone-sensitive lipase and burning fat. I'm wondering if, because I'm having a hard time reconciling calories in, calories out with people who drink fat fasting or fatty coffee or buttery coffee, is it possible that it's not the calories but some other hormone? Yes. I agree with Ken. I agree with Ken. I don't want to make light of this, but um, we sometimes look at a hormone and say it does this, when actually it does a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. So in that presentation, the, the positive effects of catecholamines for stimulating gluconeogenesis and uh, uh, cortisol um, in, in were taken out of the context that they're um, uh, stress hormones, and those are what, among other things, initiate the protein breakdown product pr pr process that occurs after the first 24 hours of a total fast. So one has to look at all components of that. And it's very complex. If someone says it's simple, um, find another teacher. Great, thank you. Is this in reference to losing weight? Yeah, in reference fat? to fat burning and short-term fasting, and I'll, obviously I was one of those people that tried uh, fatty drinks, and I found I put back on weight when I did that. So, I, and I, I don't think it was just the calories. When I question people, and not just my patients, and they're struggling to lose weight, then it's going to come down, I, things will be, one, alcohol. Two will be portion size. And I used to think of fat. Here's one fist. You know, they grab their hand, and I say, that's the amount of good nutrient-dense food that should be on your plate. And I asked them, are you a one fist or a two fist? And I've nailed two of the things pretty well. You know, most people are failing on portion size or some alcohol. Stress, do not underestimate stress because it has a positive effect hormonally, you know, related to everything you're talking about. But it also has a negative effect long term. And, and then we can talk about the other hormones that need to be addressed. You know, they're the big three address those three, at least get them on the table and get them discussed, and then come back to them. 
next visit. Great. Thank you. Um, given how central the liver is to metabolic health, can, can you share some, and how quickly it turns over, can you share maybe some um, stories about how one would know that they've got a fatty liver or it's starting to get fatty and how you might capitalize on that rapid turnover nature of the liver, you know, to get their health back? Um, so you repeat the, the beginning of that. I'm from a different country. Sorry. Sorry. No, I just I'm, I missed the first bit of it. What? Uh, given how central the liver is to metabolic health. Yeah. That part. Well, so a just, couple things. In terms of knowing if you have fatty liver, the most, uh, the, without doing a biopsy or doing a complex imaging study, uh, the transaminases, uh, uh, ALT and AST that are measured in the blood uh, 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 go up uh, as you, you have increasing uh, uh, fat accumulation in the liver. Uh, and there's a, um, a couple of equations that have been figured out that you can actually separate, you can assess your, your, um, rid, your the existence of steatosis, which is fat accumulation in the liver, and steatohepatitis, which is actually inflammation leading to damage to the liver. And when we, we published an actual paper from our one-year data from the study we did with Dr. Hallberg in Indiana uh, and showed dramatic reductions at one year in uh, uh, the predicted steatosis and steatohepatitis in that group of 260 people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, in terms of getting rid of the fat, uh, it's, you know, people think, well, it all goes out of the liver as VLDL, and we secrete VLDL, which, you know, uh, uh, is how the real liver gets rid of fat. But um, I estimate that, I that, um, uh, don't want to brag, but my liver probably mobilizes 50 grams of fat per day as ketones. Um, so if my liver makes 100 grams of beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate per day, that gets rid of 50 grams of, of fat. And it's leaving, leaving the liver as water-soluble particles or water-soluble chemicals in the blood. It's not in lipid particles. It has nothing to do with LDL. Um, so it's, it's actually ketogenesis opens up a completely new way of removing fat from the liver and reducing the risk of steatohepatitis. How, mu how much does the liver weigh if it's 50 grams or leaving per day? Do you know? Like a typical liver? There is no typical liver. One big carbohydrate meal can increase the size of your liver sixfold. And, and uh, so the answer to your question is this, and it's so simple, and yet we screw it up by making it complex. I'm a surgeon. I touch C biopsy livers every single day. My standard formula for my patients is to put them on a no-carbohydrate or as close to no-carbohydrate diet for five to seven days before the surgery. They do not have fatty liver unless they're alcoholics. So fatty liver is very simple. Carbohydrates cause fatty liver if you exclude alcohol and some of the other toxins which is alcoholic fatty liver. Non-alcoholic fatty liver, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and I'm going to use specific words here, is exclusively a disease of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. If you reduce your carbohydrate consumption below the level at which you can become ketotic, your, your, your non-alcoholic steatohepatitis goes away, I would predict in about 72 hours, but for safety's sake, five to seven days. We have biopsied over 7,000 livers and we've proven that over and over and over again. I have a photograph of every single liver I've ever operated on, and I show my patients the liver. And when they wake up after surgery, they don't ask how my surgery went, they ask me how their livers looked. <laughs> I, I speak to my, my, my radiological colleagues on CT scan. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or fatty liver, is a normal finding, and they almost have stopped reporting on it. And it's been suggested, I can remember this paper, I'm going back several years now, that 10% uh, of eight-year-olds had fatty liver disease. So, and we, we know it's reversible, you know, within days. But it's a normal radiological finding. And I don't, op I don't enter the abdomens, but I mean, the, my, the, one of my arguments to, my, to bariatric surgeons, I say, what do you do with your patients beforehand? They said, well, we put them low carb so we can actually get the liver out of the way and operate. And I said, why don't you just keep them low carb and get out of their abdomen? <laughs> <laughs>
put some actual numbers on your question. The typical liver weighs about 1.5 kilograms, um, so it's about 1,500 grams. The threshold for the diagnosis of fatty liver is 5% uh, by weight fat, so if it's more than 5% of liver weight, when it starts looking like pate, yeah. that, uh, that means you have 75 grams of fat in your liver. And if you get up to 10 or 15%, you have a very fatty liver and you're on the threshold of steatohepatitis. So if uh, a person in nutritional ketosis is mobilizing 50 grams of fat per day out of their liver in three days, they can get rid of 150 grams. They can drop their liver fat from, it doesn't, that never goes to zero, but from, you know, from 10 to, to essentially to nothing in three days uh, just by turning on ketogenesis and, and, uh, the, uh, and opening that new tap to empty the fat from the liver. Dr. Fetke makes an excellent point. So for all the healthcare providers in the room, I had to actually call my local hospital where I had abdominal ultrasounds and, and CT scans performed because I, I and, and I had to scold the radiologist and said, if they have fatty liver, damn it, I want to know. I want it on, black and white on the report. And they said, well, and basically the same thing. It's so common, sometimes we forget to mention it. True story. True story. And when I was making my fatty pancreas video on YouTube, when I was doing research, I found this Indian doctor. He was ultrasounding an abdomen, and he said, you can see some fatty streaking in the pancreas. That's normal. And he just moved on, and I'm like... What, whoa. And so for all the healthcare providers, talk to your radiologist and tell them in no uncertain terms, if they have fatty liver or fatty, fatty streaking in the pancreas, I want that in black and white on the radiology report. Because otherwise they might not even mention it. And, and none of the doctors know this, what you're sharing. No, no, no doctor I've ever talked to knows that we're trying to go see, you know, will ever share how to reverse fatty liver or, you're, as you're saying, even put it down as a diagnosis, so thank you. Hi, I'm just wondering, um, uh, in the terms of like fasting and autoimmune diseases, is there any truth to um, fasting for uh, longer than three days to reset your immune system so that it uh, doesn't start attacking and you can build new immune cells? And on top of that, if someone has multiple autoimmune uh, syndrome, what other than going low carb, what do you suggest for them? There's a lot of um, observational evidence um, that uh, with a ketogenic diet, um, autoimmune diseases improve. And I think most of us can give you quite a few mm -hmm. stories of that. There haven't been very many concerted, you know, prospective studies. But uh, rheumatoid arthritis frequently gets much better. People come off $60,000 a year of Humira. Uh, because they don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, the question is, is fasting any better than a well-formulated ketogenic diet? And I, that was my fourth slide. It's, you know, when you're on a, no longer on a, a, uh, a, ketone, uh, or a ketosis suppressing diet, um, you will get those benefits. Um, so, you know, the, What's the role of fasting as opposed to a well-formulated ketogenic diet? No one has done that comparison, okay. um, and it needs to be done. So, because if if the, the if total fast works better, we should know, and I'd be happy to adopt it. I try to stay away from the black box of immunology, and that's really what it is for me. But I get a lot of patients who are gluten-free, and it's very sexy and. Everybody advertises gluten-free. Look, if you're going to stop eating gluten, stop eating carbohydrates. It's kind of the same thing, and it's much easier. Um, and it just makes such a difference to patients who've had irritation uh, disease from gluten, which is, a, I think, a proven antigen in a number of people now. And coming off carbohydrates, it makes coming off gluten very, very easy, just like carnivore makes coming off carbohydrates very easy. So my advocacy is, if you want to go be gluten-free, just stop eating carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to add on that point, which I think is a good one, and I often make the same one, but um, it's not just um, gluten, and just getting back to the same issue I was saying before, there, uh, it, there are people, especially people with autoimmune diseases, that find that they are allergic to plant foods, oxalates, lectins, I mean, it's just worth exploring them. It's not something that people talk about or you hear about much, but it is, you do see that, um, that when people remove them from their diets, they 
you know, that's, that is the, that makes the difference for them. So you're suggesting maybe a carnivore to start, like carnivore? Just experimenting with that. Um, it may not be the answer, but I mean, for people who have autoimmune diseases, it's quite serious, and, and you know, there's really nothing you can do in terms of uh, medication, pharmaceuticals, so it's worth exploring what you might be uh, allergic to in the diet, and especially things that are not, often people will talk about, you should eliminate dairy, or you, know, mm -hmm. or you should eliminate meat, but I mean, that's what you'll hear in conventional, you know, conventional advice, but there's the non-conventional advice that does seem to work for many people, just anecdotally, is to look at things like lectins and oxalates and other, other toxins in plants. Thank you. Hi there. <clears throat> I have two questions, and Brian said it's okay, so it's really quick, if you don't mind. The first one is, I'm wondering how many of you routinely check testosterone, uh, especially in your obese male patients? And then just quickly, uh, some tips on how to gain trust in the male species of patient. Like, say this, definitely don't say that. Do you have any, any tips? <laughs> yeah, I, I check testosterone levels in virtually every male and female over the age of 35 to 40 and sometimes much, much younger depending on the symptoms they come to me with. Um, testosterone is not just a male hormone. It, women need their testosterone to be optimal as well. Uh, I didn't understand the second part of the question. I, so, felt, I felt slightly triggered by it. <laughs> Could you repeat that? <laughs> so, so that I shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> I was just kidding about the triggered part. I think the only comment about um, the sex steroids, testosterone and estrogen, but really progesterone as well, they're all cholesterol precursors. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned in my talk is especially high insulin producers um, insulin blocks the first transformation step of cholesterol toward the six sex steroid hormones, particularly testosterone. So the assumption is that almost every fat male that comes into my office, our diabetic male, but usually the fatter they are, the more insulin productive they are. Um, you can assume that they have low testosterone or testosterone deficiency. So you've got two options. You can either give them testosterone or you can get the insulin level down. And one of, the, one of the beautiful things about so many of my males and females, commonest complication in my practice, 12%, is unexpected pregnancy because PCOS goes away. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a male fertility. They don't get pregnant, but their testosterone does go up. I don't measure it, but the sex steroid hormones do increase appropriately when you remove the blockade of insulin. So, so do you choose to routinely uh, trickle in a little bit of testosterone or just play the waiting game? I don't know much about testosterone treatment. In, okay. in the US, it's a quackery. Okay. Um, there are shops in West Palm Beach where I work that advertise male fertility. You can go in, 100% of people that walk through the door have low testosterone so that they can prescribe their own medication. Uh, so I've got a tremendous distrust for the prescription of testosterone. That's, okay. that, that's emotional, it's not scientific. Okay. And there is quite a bit of quackery in the, the, the testosterone optimization sphere. Um, I, do, I do optimize testosterone in my practice. I always try to switch them to a ketogenic diet first because the doctor's exactly right. When you lower their chronic hyperinsulinemia, all of the, the gender hormones start to improve, and, I've, and I check their, their levels as they go along because they come in gung-ho, they want some testosterone, right? And so I'm like, that's kind of my gate. If you, if you get through my, my ketogenic gate and you don't elevate your testosterone back up to a, a normal or optimal level, then we'll talk about optimization, but not until then. Thanks very much. You, you asked about motivating males. Yes. Thank you. I don't test testosterone. Um, it's not within my scope of practice, even though, anyway, that no, gets me into trouble. Um, there are certain, so apart from the health benefits and weight control and fat loss, which I'm taking that board on board, thank you. Uh, I have some, so if I see a young male, you know, a teenage male covered in acne, that's a, that's a no brainer, okay, that, that's a, because most young males are not interested in having too many acne. 
So I don't, you know, no, I think we were talking about it earlier. There's no use uh, talking about the risk of diabetes and heart disease to a teenager, but they hate acne. Then you've got the young adult male who's at university who's becoming vegan because all the women are vegan around him and he wants to have sex. So <laughs> I say, okay, go vegan for a while, and then when do you get sick, go carnival, you know, you start eating meat again. But again, the surprising number of young men have got little bellies on them. They start to develop their insulin-resistant abdomen, and that, they, they, and that's again, that's a little bit of a. I'm examining their knee, and I'm talking to them. Well, you know, talk about weight and how much load you're putting across it. Oh, by the way, you, you know, if you drop 10 pounds here, you're going to lose 80 pounds of pressure off your knee. Mm. So that's a sporting thing and a performance thing. And then if I've got the young athlete, I actually start talking about endurance and uh, and sports performance. And I know which football teams in Australia are running low carb. You know, and there are certain basketball teams in the US and soccer teams around the world that are doing it. So we can actually talk about that and sort of that's, these are male ins. The moment they get into marriage and into later, then I say, you know, we, it's okay to start talking about sex and erectile dysfunction. And it's really strange as an orthopaedic surgeon, but we, I ran a, a couple of meetings with older males. And you know, it's just how do we get you motivated? Well, when was the last time you saw your old fella? You know, and, and they haven't. And they because erectile dysfunction is one of the very first signs of cardiovascular disease. And I did tell a story to a couple of people earlier, but I had a woman come into me with a knee problem. She's in her mid fifties. New patient walks in the door, says, "Doctor Fedke, thank you for my husband's erection." <laughs> I am not kidding. That was her opening line. I haven't even asked her which knee is the problem. Right? She's actually said, she said, we've been following what you're talking about and thank you. And this is, so that you ask what the male terms in and you know, what are the catchphrases and I think it is age related and they are opportunities to start a conversation. I mean, it's, thank you, that's you extremely helpful. Thank you. One of my biggest surprises as a primary doing this kind of medicine is seeing uh, mental illness getting better, depression, anxiety, stress, you know, stress eating, all these kind of things that, we're con that, that are obviously associated with, with the obesity crisis that we're having. My question is I see a lot of people, as a matter of fact, I just interviewed a psychiatrist from Harvard who's reversing schizophrenia with a ketogenic diet. His reasoning was we're using the same medicines as we're using for seizures. We interviewed someone who had seizures for 40 years, weighed 300 pounds, now she's 140 pounds, no seizures for three years on a ketogenic diet. And her doctor said, it's too dangerous. We're going to cut out part of your brain instead. And so I, the other thing I've noticed along those terms that really got me thinking more about this with our clinical experience is if you see Sean Baker's Twitter feed, he gets death threats and, and wants his family you know, murdered and all these things. Do you think this is just an ideologic problem, or do you think this actual mental illness with uh, you know, because we're seeing it reversed with, as a matter of fact, carnivores. I see P I've talked to vegans, ex-vegans, who started eating meat, and all these negativity and, and hating the world and being agitated gets better. What, what do you think the ideology of that is? It, well, it's, it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> we as can talk surgeon. about inflammation. We can talk about microvascular uh, disease. We can talk about... Uh, sugar highs, we can talk about addiction, we can talk about hyperinsulinemia, we can talk about cortisol, they're all there. Mm -hmm. um, I use by way of example what happens if you give kids sugar at a party? Exactly. They go crazy, don't they? A few hours, then what are they like? They're flat and depressed. Mm -hmm. So just imagine if we gave everyone on the planet sugar at the one time. What do we see? We see it around us right now. We see everyone's crazy, everyone's anxious, everyone's depressed. You know, it's this fluctuating mood. It's very hard to go to the shops and not, you know, and, and get happy happy service. You know, you can get happy meals, but it's hard to get happy yeah, service. Yeah, it, so, it's it's clearly all related. And one of the common themes when you're actually on social media is n equals one times a thousand. People say, I've gone low carb. I've cut the sugar out of my diet. I've gone keto, I'm more relaxed, my mental health issues have improved. 
and it, it is being, some of the psychiatric journals are now having articles about health and diet, and that's new. They're coming around. Yeah, I think it's both. <clears throat> I think it's ideology and I think it's uh, mental, mental illness that is carbohydrate induced. But uh, yeah, you, sometimes some of the, the vegans and the, the Kiko nuts and the, um, you know, the, the whole grain people just lose their faculties mm -hmm. on Twitter. They really do. And, and, and you and me and Sean and Tro and some other people seem to really bring that out in them. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> well, as somebody with no vegan trolls at all on yeah. Twitter, um, I, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, I think that what's going on in social media is a, is, a, is, is a mixture of real ideological anger, possibly fueled by, you know, cholesterol depletion in the brain. I don't, I don't know. Um, but, you know, you, there's also just vast, uh, there's a huge number of industries that are on Twitter. You really don't know who's a person and a real person and who's a, sure. an industry. I mean, just, just to remind you, the World Business Council, which includes, like, Nestle, Mars, Pepsi, and, um, and like, six of the biggest pharmaceutical companies on the planet, is behind the Eat Lancet vegan diet. So, you know, I don't know what they're spending their hundreds of millions of PR dollars on, but you can sure you can be sure some of them are are Twitter trolls <laughs> going after people like you. So um, so it's just you know it's just the wild west out there and you really don't know if it's a real person or not and that's why it's good to block um, rather than I mean as soon as you understand that somebody's not interested in a genuine exchange or a genuine argument or is really not listening to you and is just out to bash you, there's just no point in having that conversation, I don't think. I just wait for Tro to jump in, I could relax. Yeah, that's right. He'll, he'll take for them a on for you. Read yeah. the read the read out. I just had to tell just a tiny anecdote, which is that at, at low carb Breckenridge, um, it's sort of the flip side of the this <laughs> mental unhealth ill health story is that um, we were at the hotel and there were things going wrong and you know something wasn't quite right and the people working at the front desk just said on day two they said. You know, you low carb people are like the chillest group of people That's we true. have ever seen. It's Doug like, Reynolds told me the same thing. They always thank him like, after the conferences, it's no and that, there's truth to that. We're fine. Yeah. We're we're keto. This kind of conversation makes me very nervous. Um, chill. chill. That's why I just asked the and question. No, I let you guys answer. In, uh, one of the things, uh, back in the, the 60s, when the sugar industry was getting heat from Yudkin and others about the possible dangers of sugar, one of the reasons the sugar industry thought that all the anti-sugar people were quacks was because at the time, J.J. Rodow was one of the founders of the org uh, uh, organic food movement, actually the founder, um, had written a book in which he blamed both Hitler and Napoleon on sugar and their sweet tooths and said there would like seven million more Jews would have been alive today if it wasn't for sugar. And so there's just a, the, all these extreme dialogues on some level. I mean, they, there could be some truth to it. I just came back from a vacation at my in-laws, uh, which meant my kids were sugar loaded for 10 days. And um, yeah, I wasn't that chill on my keto diet with my 10-year-old <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, he's, he was ugly at the airport at JFK yesterday. Um, bad, bad day. Anyway, I just, um, yeah, there's, it's, it is a brave new world out there with this, I mean, it's, yeah, I can't make sense of any of it, but I, the conversation, just the level of dialogue in the, the is, 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 leads to people thinking the worst of everyone, including us. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's why the Eat Lancet is so concerning to a lot of us saying, uh oh, mental health, all these things are going to be getting worse as a result, an unintended consequence. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, um, again, if you've listened or heard any of my work, my focus is on the emotion management aspect of replacing carbohydrates with effective emotion management systems. 
More people die on a daily basis of carbohydrate toxicity than die annually in the opioid crisis. And yet all the verbiage, all the focus is on opioids right now rather than carbohydrates, obesity, diabetes. But I think this is an opportunity not just to talk about carbohydrates, but to talk about how our society generally has shifted away from effective parenting to help our kids to mitigate against emotional distress that is increasing all the time. We more and more use substances and productivity as a way to help them to repress issues. And what we're seeing is carbohydrates being used earlier and earlier and younger and younger to pacify kids and to give them a, an instant form of gratification, euphoria, tranquility that numbs or obliterates and, and just negates an emotion without allowing them the time to process through it. Uh, meditation is gone because it detracts from productivity. And I think that's where a large part of the mental dysfunction is coming from. And there's no question in my mind, in my practice, that carbohydrates are as much a drug as any of the commonly labeled drugs on the DSM-5, I think it is now. Um, we learned a lot about the benefits of the ketogenic diet in um, fetal development and pregnancy. And I was just wondering if um, anyone is collecting data on pregnant women that choose to do the ketogenic diet? And if not, is there any information from historical populations like the Inuit that um, they change or do differently when they are pregnant? Uh, <clears throat> we have quite a few thousand patients that we now manage uh, on a ketogenic diet. Some of them, a fair number of them, are women in childbearing years. We counsel, because it's outside the standard of care and their medical legal risks, we counsel uh, the women in, in their childbearing years to uh, use protection against pregnancy. And um, some of them do. Um, uh, and when uh, pregnancy occurs, we then have them sign a release saying that we had warned them that the consequences of this are completely unknown and then we allow them to stay on the ketogenic diet. And we have a registry, uh, we have an IRB approved registry where we collect data on our patients and uh, we will have a large body of evidence, and uh, not of our own doing, by secondary intent uh, of women who successfully go through pregnancy and if they're unsuccessful, we'll collect that data too. And so we are, we are tracking that and I would yeah, who knows? You know, a couple of years from now, we'll probably have a few thousand pregnancies um, and uh, be able to get a, have a sense of, and again, it's not randomized, it's in no way controlled. It's uh, happening against our advice, but we will collect that data and uh, we'll have a sense of what the, the uh, average birth weight is, which is typically either premature birth or overweight and, you know, hypersomia in, 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 pregnant, uh, in infants uh, delivered at term. Uh, and we'll just have the demographic and be able to go from there. We exist as a species because of the ketogenic diet. Every one of our ancestors prior to the 1940s and 50s was on a ketogenic diet when my parents, my grandparents became pregnant. Why is it so dangerous for us now? That's the first thing. The second thing is the commonest source of infertility is PCOS. I treat PCOS on a ketogenic diet and the um, rates of pregnancy go through the roof when you come on a ketogenic diet. The third concept is the, the other aspect of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, if you don't have PCOS, is gestational diabetes. And the single best treatment for any form of diabetes is a ketogenic diet. I'm going to say something the doctors always say, how the hell can the ketogenic diet not be the best diet for a pregnant mother? Thank you. How on earth did we let this happen, that the ketogenic diet is not the default position in all life, and particularly in pregnancy? And the, the, the concern, I mean, this is, I mean, I was actually threatened uh, by a medical board member for, if, if I was recommending ketogenic diets, babies would die. I was threatened with that, and therefore you must stop this because babies will die. Um, how naive, but the fact is, you know, I'm, I've, I see that, and this is the same tone of, oh my God, 
gestational diabetes. You know, it is, it's the elephant in the room. It is, we have to be talking about it. And the fact that there's hushed tones in the United States, guess what, they're hushed tones in the US, uh, sorry, in Australia and, and, in, and in Europe. Um, we didn't talk about gestational diabetes in Indonesia. Um, you know, we're very proud and open about the fact that our daughter ran a ketogenic pregnancy and who's running a low carb lifestyle for our grandson. He's a nugget, he's fabulous. And I've, off the back end on social media and a lot of times on private messages, there are many, many women who look for that support. They don't get it in the hospitals, they don't get it from the healthcare providers. And in fact, if they get diagnosed with gestational diabetes, they're encouraged to have 190, 100 grams of, of carbohydrate per meal. It's just criminal. Um, and, the, and the women who are running low carb in pregnancy are doing it, you know, you know closeted. I mean, it, it's, I, I, I'm devastated. And this is one of those topics. And I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I'm, you know, completely unqualified to make that comment, but I do have an MBBS. This is, this is our future and from Rob's work, and I hope some of you saw, many of you saw it, if we run not low carb, then we're destroying the next generation. That's really what it boils down to. You know, his work is just phenomenal, that lecture is, I hope if you didn't see it, get online and watch it. It is criminal to not run low carb or not create the option and certainly not to make it considered a safe option for those women that decide to do it. Uh, I generally agree with what Rob and Gary said, but it makes me exceedingly nervous. Um, again, the, I would like to see what the results of your unintended try, uh, observational study on these children are. I would love, it would be very nice to have a few thousand anecdotal examples of what happens in pregnancy. The first obligation right is do no harm and it's an extreme intervention. Even if it's a historically based intervention, I don't think I would say our parents before the 1940s or 50s are on ketogenic diets. I think I might go back to the 1740s before I would claim that they're all on ketogenic diets. There were plenty of carbs around. I do think that we're probably, that the obesity epidemic itself is probably in part due to the transmission from mother to child of, of uh, insulin resistance in the womb and that the, the it's the, the adverse effect of carbohydrates that are driving in part the obesity epidemic, not just what we're consuming today, but what our mothers and our grandmothers consume. But nonetheless, one way or the other, a ketogenic diet in pregnancy is an extreme intervention. And it's one thing to do it, you know, as, as, as to, to, to volunteer to do it yourself, or to have your daughter do it. It's another thing to, uh, advise it to your patients with the amount of data we have today and there's nothing I would like to see more than clinical trials of ketogenic diets uh, in pregnancy. I imagine they would be almost impossible to get an IRB to approve but maybe as the world changes that'll change. Um, but until then, uh, you know, speaking as a journalist, if I was a physician I might support if my patient wanted to do it but I don't I think I would hesitate to advise it unless it was being done, you know, for our type 2 diabetes or obesity and the pregnancy came along anyway. I would just like to see a hell of a lot more data. I've got an idea for that. I actually think, you know, part of my talk was the fact that current research and current scientific methods have been thrown out the door. But we should be able to collect enough N equals 1 data. I've certainly got a couple of ideas of that. They're just like the engineer, engineers do, they collect a whole lot of data and they look at a pattern. So it's very easy to actually, on social media, say send in your stories. We kind of a, a survey monkey sort of situation. We all put it out there and say, I'm mean, I mean just here. We've got enough of us. have got enough social media following, and we throw in the others, low carbers around, who have got a high social media profile, and say, here's a survey monkey. We just want women who have run low carb in their pregnancy to tell their stories, A, safe, B, complications, good and bad, you know, just quickly tell a story. And I think very quickly we will have not an N equals 100, we'll have an N equals 1,000 because I know they're out there. 
and that's a pilot group because all I mean that, that's what that low carb this type one grid group, group ran with. The biggest study beforehand was 12. The second biggest before that was eight, and then they came out with 120, saying here are children who are type one who have run low carb who are reaching their milestones HbA1c of 5.7 without retardation and growth, and I think we can. I mean, it's there to be done. I mean, I've got all these ideas for research. And again, that's not traditional research, and it's cheap. And then all of a sudden you've got a pilot group of 1,000 saying it's considered a safe option for those people that choose it. That's all we're trying to do with the dietary guidelines. That's for those people that want to grow low-carb, keto, that seem to be a safe option for those that wish to choose it, and they should be supported, not to have it demonised. And I'm just, you know, there's an, can we do that? I think we can. I think uh, Gary is absolutely right. So I'm going to retract a statement I made. Um, there's no evidence to support the fact that a ketogenic diet is important for mothers intending to become pregnant or during pregnancy. But we know absolutely that uh, before pregnancy, mothers benefit, babies benefit from a mother taking folate. It avoids neural tube defects. We know absolutely, as absolutely as that, that the supplementation of DHA and 3 omega fatty acids help uh, with brain development and that a high-fat diet helps with brain development of the fetus. And we also know that insulin blocks the utilization of uh, fat by the mother and by the baby, and therefore a high-carbohydrate diet is deleterious to the ketogenic um, absorption of fat, particularly essential fat by the baby. So I retract the fact that a ketogenic diet is necessary, but a low-carbohydrate, high-essential fatty acid uh, diet is essential for a healthy baby. And there's scientific evidence to support each one of those facts. Yeah, and I think we're, I think we're playing on their home field again. Because let me, let me ask all the experts up here and anyone in the audience, feel free to, to chime up. Well, when a, when a, a newly pregnant woman goes to her obstetrician for her intake exam and he hands her that front and back page nutrition handout about what to eat. How much compelling evidence is there to support that and show that it's safe for the baby and the mother? Is it, is it none? Does any, can anybody refute that, that none is the answer? Unfortunately, so unfortunately, power, it's, unfortunately, it's the standard of care. It's the standard of care, that's right, it, it, based on eminence-based medicine. So, yeah, and so it, with all, all everything set up here, I agree with every bit of it. But uh, I'm still happy if, if one of my uh, female patients gets pregnant, I'm happy to counsel her on the proper human diet and how that will help her have the best pregnancy and her, her newborn have the best outcome. One other comment, standard of care in a gynecologist or obstetrician's office is to do a glucose tolerance test or look for gestational diabetes. And the current treatment of gestational diabetes is metformin and diabetic medications. Well, I guess, some of you in this audience might understand that lowering your carbohydrate consumption helps with diabetes of any sort. Um, but that is not an optional treatment in other offices, in the standard obesity, uh, uh, obstetrical office. So maybe I'm out of line saying that a ketogenic diet is a good idea. But if you lower your carbohydrate consumption, you increase your fatty acid consumption, is that not a ketogenic diet? And another thing. On that first intake ex exam, uh, the, the young lady has her blood work drawn. Uh, this, is, this is especially triggering for me. We don't check for gestational diabetes until 28 weeks. Tell me. Right, but a young, a young woman in her early 20s who's not obese, she's, she's going to get a fasting blood sugar. That's going to be the only screening until she's 28 weeks. Right? That, that's right, yes. And so this young lady can have undiagnosed type 2 diabetes because we all know that a fasting blood sugar, you can have severely uncontrolled type 2 diabetes and have a normal fasting blood sugar, right? And so I think that every health care provider in here needs to go back to their community and, and insist that the obstetricians check an A1C with that, that, that initial intake so that you can capture the type 2 diabetes that's as of yet undiagnosed because is that not damaging that fetus until the 28th week? 
Of course, is that not increasing all the risk factors? There's nothing magic about 28 weeks. That's just arbitrarily where ACOG says that's where we're going to do the glucose screening test. So there's that. Yeah, I just wanted to add that one thing that's happened in this conversation is we are conflating carbohydrate restriction has sort of slid down into a ketogenic diet. And there, you can have ways of improving the carbohydrate content of the diet. You can get rid of the sugar consumption. You can have lower glycemic index carbohydrates. There's a lot of range, and you can get them to cut back on carbs without it being a ketogenic diet, which crosses into a more extreme intervention. And by virtue of being more extreme, it's riskier and maybe healthier. I think it is. I agree with all you guys. That's my bias. But I would love to see more evidence. So we'll call it by another name. Yeah, and I agree that these... <laughs> I think the, the, the key is not to call it by a name but call it by the best practices. You know, the one thing that is near and dear to my heart is that if you have gestational diabetes in the first trimester, there's a seven-fold increase in, autistic, uh, in an autistic outcome, and there is a four times increase of preeclampsia and a stillbirth. That's fact. So, and the gestational diabetes is, I don't, I don't think anybody's gonna argue with me, it's related to chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. So call it by whatever name you, you want to call it, or call it Hey You. A low-carbohydrate, high-essential fatty acid diet is, in my opinion, the best way for a pregnant mother to eat for the best benefit for her baby. Okay, so my question is from a doctor. Uh, what are the side effects for bone loss and long-term in ketosis? Well, it depends on the, on the ketosis and what the person's eating, I guess. In our hands with the uh, uh, Indiana University Health Study, we uh, measured uh, uh, spine bone density at, at two years, and it was unchanged. What about, is there any 10 or 20 year studies, more epidemiological? Uh, come back in 18 years. Because I've never, no, you know, Nobody's been doing a prospective study that long. Because so I've never seen it, you know, question. with kids Thank where you. they kick them out of ketosis, so it's not like you can see a kid for 20 years doing this because the parents screw it up, you know? I'm sorry, I can't hear it. So because the parents kick the kids out of ketosis, there's no way to see long-term studies with children unless your parents are feeding you ketosis from day one on forward, right? So until we can see long-term, I guess, I guess two years is a start is what I'm getting at maybe? There is no epidemiological evidence on the ketogenic diet or low-carb diets because people just simply haven't been on them for that long. Um, so what we have is uh, an, an epidemiological evidence in any case is not very reliable So because it requires self-reporting of data. So it's very, very weak and unreliable data. So what you really want are long-term clinical trials because that's a rigorous kind of evidence that is more reliable. So what is the total clinical trial evidence we have on various diets? Um, currently, this two-year study that the at Indiana uh, Indiana University Health that is that is one of the um, that is a long considered a long term clinical trial. We don't have uh, we don't have we have one study on the Mediterranean diet that is longer than that, but was retracted and reissued with serious data problems. So Mediterranean diet one study with serious data problems. Vegetarian diet zero studies. Uh, the, the, what they call the U.S. style diet, which is, there are three dietary patterns that are sanctioned by our government, vegetarian, despite there being no clinical trials on it, Mediterranean, supported by one clinical trial, and then this U.S. style diet, which is, um, you know, these are all, this is all the government's diets. U.S. Diet style is based on all the DASH studies, only, almost exclusively on middle-aged men, none of them longer than eight weeks. So when you're talking about your right, there is a paucity of evidence, but there is a paucity of evidence for all diets. I mean, the ketogenic diet or the low-carb diet or the lower-carbohydrate diet actually has more clinical trial evidence than any of those other diets that I just mentioned. So you don't think it will cause bone loss long-term? I have no idea, mm. but I'm saying we don't know that for any diet. Or maybe, yes, go ahead. There's a geographer named Jared Diamond who has written a number of very provocative books, Collapse, Cone Germs and Steel, 
Long before that, back in 1986, he had published an article in Discover magazine entitled The Worst Mistake Humanity Ever Made. And he basically uh, took archaeological evidence, scientific archaeological evidence from the Fertile Crescent up, up from 10,000 10, years ago to 12,000 years ago. And he basically looked at, they looked at skeletal remains of Homo sapiens who lived in that region before the advent of agriculture and after the advent of agriculture. And what they were looking at were bones. And what they noted was that the uh, height of the average male was reduced by six inches after the advent of agriculture compared to before. Uh, and for females, it was like three or four inches. And the quality of the bone was reduced for the patient, for the individuals once they adopted agriculture in terms of bone density and uh, evidence for nutrient deficiencies. So um, we do have you know, that archeological evidence from long, long ago, and maybe that's not valid. Uh, but there, uh, it's a theoretical issue. I've, I have had dietitians tell me, well, because your patients are acidemic, it's gonna dissolve their bones, that the, the alkali, uh, the hydroxyapatite crystals in the bone be dissolved by acid. But, Somebody on a well-formulated ketogenic diet is not acidemic. The, the bicarbonate buffer uh, protects the body from uh, a significant change in blood pH and, and uh, um, extracellular tissue pH. So I, I, I think it's a non-issue until we have countervailing evidence. Thank you. This is actually within my field of scope of practice as an orthopedic surgeon. We have got really, really good data for the standard diet at this point in time showing a progressive loss of bone over time. You know, we've been doing bone density studies for at least 30 or 40 years. And once you've reached menopause, then there's a steady decline in bone density. Well documented over and over and over. You could talk about hormones and situation, but that's a documentation. Um, so we've got good data for the standard, well, you know, the standard American diet, standard Australian diet, the fad diet. So we know what's happening with that at this point in time. Um, I've got my own personal sto uh, story. I've been on um, um, dexamethasone for a replacement of Addison's for a pituitary tumour for 20 years. And my bone density, I, I'm, I didn't want to have steroids. So I've been on steroids for 20 years. My bone density was going slowly, steadily down in a predictable fashion. It started from a good high point, and then I went on to low carb, and it's flatlined. Okay? It's N equals 1. I've had two patients come up to me, one particularly in New Zealand came up to me and she said, I went low carb, I've got osteoporosis, I've gone low carb, and my bone density has improved by 20%. Now, that can't happen. If you get, go on to the best drugs, you might get a 1% improvement, 1.5, they might advertise a bit more, but it's very, very little. And I looked at it and I went, thank you, very interesting. I then had someone I know with uh, cystic fibrosis, which turned her entire life around by going all CHF because they need an enormous amount of calories. And Jess, uh, I know, and she had her bone density checked on the same machine and the same thing in a two-year period. She had a 20% improvement of osteoporosis. So I did the Facebook, tell me your stories, because I wanted to know. And at the end of the day, I had an N equals 11 study of improvement in bone density or stabilisation of bone density over a couple of years, only two years. You know, the people had fortunately you know, had their bone density for one reason or other tested, and then they had it tested again. I got, so one Facebook post some years ago, n equals 11. It's out there, but I didn't. I had an n equals zero for deterioration. Now again, that's short term, but it's not. That's actually real people who have not had a deterioration and who have actually had a turnaround. When we know doing nothing is a steady decline for the vast majority of the population, we just need to duplicate that. Again, it's not good science by the scientific method, by all those things, it's not a double-blind controlled study. Nothing interventional in nutrition can ever be double-blind controlled over a 20 or 30 year period because of the covariance. So, I mean, I, I personally, I've got my story, but I'm fascinated by it because, I, and the most important thing about bone, bone uh, health is actually having the ability to absorb your fat soluble vitamins, particularly vitamin D and vitamin K2. Very little spoken about vitamin K2 comes from your pasture fed meats, dairy, eggs. 
that I think is the critical thing. It's the thing which decides that the calcium goes between whether or not it's been lodging in your arteries or in your bone. It, that's, so I think that, that personally, and I've been looking at this for eight or nine years now, I am not at all fussed about bone health. And in fact, I think well formulated ketogenic, proper human, human diet <laughs> is going to be fine. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Hi. We know that obesity is a danger to our health and losing body fat can help us restore health, but fat cells also store many of the hundreds of toxins that we ingest every day and that we inhale every day. And I'm wondering if any of you can speak to the issue of what happens to those toxins in bodies that are already stressed and what can mitigate the toxicity of, of unleashing them. So there's just one thing that triggered me when, as you started to speak. I don't know much about the toxin side. There are other folks that do, but this. Uh, obesity is the body, the ability to become obese is the body's defense mechanism yeah. against no. sugar in the bloodstream. Yeah. The only thing that obesity does to human beings is it puts money in um, Gary's pocket because it hurts your hips, knees, and ankles. Other than that, obesity is a defense mechanism. It's when you lose the ability to make fat that bad things start to happen. I don't know much about the toxicity, but I just, okay. it's so important yeah. for no, me for I, patients to understand it, that. It, the fat cells are a protective mechanism in holding toxins. So what happens to the body when those toxins are unleashed because fat cells are, are lost? So I've, I've heard that theory that toxins are stored in the fat and if you lose, lose fat then those toxins will come out and somehow poison you. Haven't seen a lot of data uh, supporting that, but I do know that we have a liver that either breaks down, conjugates, or, or tags toxins and then our kidneys excrete the toxins. And so I think we've got a couple of built-in mechanisms should there be this uh, toxin deloading, that we would quickly take care of that within a couple of uh, circulations around our body in the circulatory system. But I, I, I keep, I've heard this theory many times, but I've never seen any compelling research. Anybody ever seen anything that we, we hold all these, these uh, environmental toxins in our fat? And publish a case series. I've seen, not in person, but um, yeah, with photographs sent to me, three cases of what I'm convinced is a <coughs> ketogenic diet associated rash. Um, and that's probably, and people are hypothesizing that's driven by toxins. And I don't know the answer to that. <coughs> but that's probably that that's the numerator the denominator i can only guess in my you know 35 or 40 years of, of doing this but it's probably the denominator somewhere 10 to 20,000 patients uh, from which that's derived which means that particular issue is is very rare thank you can i use that as a segue into a question for the panel for we there are uh, people who lose an enormous amount of weight and they lose it quickly, often have got skin folds that is flapping around and look for surgery. So surgery and having it all cut out might be the quick way to get rid of that peripheral fat toxin. I'm not, this made me think about it. But I have a question to the panel. For my impression is that those people who lose significant amounts of weight by doing it LCHF, keto, and who maintain a very adequate protein intake do not have the issue and they tend to shrink back far better as part of that whole collagen effect, the whole shrinking episode is actually related to, to, to protein intake. And because, so if you go on a starvation diet and you lose an enormous amount of weight, that, you know, which is biggest loser sort of stuff, they've got folds hanging off them, they've got to go and have surgery to have it off. But those people who have, a, you know, have adequate and, I don't, and I'm fascinated, Steve, to work out what that number is because I personally pushed up my whatever that 0.8 is up a bit. I don't know what mine is, but I've had a bit more protein. But 
if you lose that, so any comments about do you think having an adequate protein intake is protective from all that skin fold flabbiness that needs to be resected later? I think the key to detoxification is, is liver function. As long as you have normal LFTs, liver function tests, reasonably normal liver function tests, our liver will protect us. We've lived in among, among toxins, toxins for you know, much of our evolution. I mean, the wood smoke is toxic. <laughs> and when you're cold and up close to the fire, you probably were getting a lot of that too. Um, I don't want to make light of it, but yeah, it, no, and, it, and, it, until there's good. evidence that, that there is a, you know, um, you know, we have blood and adipose tissue levels of something and show it accumulates with, or goes up with weight loss, it's a theoretical question in most cases. I wonder if it has something to do with the Herxheimer reaction that happens because of the microflora shifts that happen when people go keto. Because are you guys familiar with that? Can you say more clearly, please? It's called a Herxheimer reaction, H-E-R-X-H-E-I-M-E-R. -E -E it's usually because um, endotoxins are released from certain bacterial strains that usually is associated with like Lyme disease and um, if people have a high amount of yeast, and that gets killed off all at once. The medical so. term for a detox reaction. Could we uh, maybe have, we've been up here for a couple hours. That's why you see us squirming and twitching now. So maybe uh, two more questions or three quick ones with quick answers. This, and this is quick. I have a quick comment, and then I'm taking my sister to the airport, so I've got to skedaddle. I just want to say, my name is Carol, and I'm a vegetarian. And there are vegetarians, that's supposed to be a joke on a, um, yes, I know. Um, there are vegetarians that are keto, and we're not all, you know, negative. I'm not a vegan. I don't, I couldn't do it. Um, but Dr. Ben is my brother-in-law, and he and my sister kind of got me sat me down and said, you got to change or you're going to, you're, you're on the border of death there. Um, and he said, if you just need to eat peanut butter, eat peanut butter, because that's better than just eating carbs. So I just want to say for all of us vegetarians, I know you guys, most of you are doctors and you're looking at everything and the whole thing, but just to get us started, don't forget us and know that we can start without having to eat meat, and some of us can eat eggs. So that's all I want to say. And also, Dr. Ben's exercises will add, get your bones stronger, because my mom now doesn't take Vosimex. So. Well, thank you for coming and making that comment. And I think everybody up here would agree with me that you know, to reducing carbs is the essential thing. You can be absolutely healthy. You can do that diet as a vegetarian. You can do that diet as a vegan. You have to be maybe more careful with supplementation, but it is you can reach those macros in with any kind of diet. And maybe I know that the Verda just came out with a new post on low carb for vegans and vegetarians. If for if you want some guidance yeah. on that, so I just wanted to say a shout. Yeah, out no, us. it's Thank a very you. good point, and I'm glad you came up to say that. Hi guys. Um, just thank you so much for all the decades of work that you have put in on elucidating the problems with the standard American diet. I wanted to go back to this issue of mental health. Um, I'm in the field of processed food addiction. And I think one thing that really helps the conversation is to divide carbs into drug-like food substances and real food. So a sweet potato is real food. Sugar is read by the brain as a drug. Gluten, dairy, excessive salt, caffeine, food additives. Once the tobacco companies came into processed foods in the 1980s, these substances that are read by the brain as drugs were loaded up into processed foods, and then the obesity epidemic starts from there, along with the changes in the food guidelines. So we know all drugs have deleterious effects on mood. Depression, irritability, anxiety are common in drug addicts. So 
I think that some of the, and, and there is evidence for things like downregulation of dopamine pathways, um, increased levels of circulating cortisol, unstable blood glucose, factors which would affect mood profoundly. And when you withdraw those substances, even if you don't go keto, you are de facto going low carb versus the standard American diet. We know that people are eating on average one pound per person per day of sugars, flours, and french fries. So there, there's really good evidence for a change in mental health from withdrawing refined carbohydrates from the, from the food. So I wondered if any of you work on that concept where you're distinguishing these highly refined carbohydrates from unrefined carbohydrates. Thanks, Joan. We love your work. Um, I was introduced to it a little while ago and really love what you have to say, and you say it compassionately. I, I think there are two separate levels. One of the, for me, the way I look at it is the toxicity of sugar comes from how toxicity is control how sugar is controlled in the bloodstream. And the philosophy that I have is that if glucagon is your primary trigger for sugar in your bloodstream, in other words, if the carbohydrate is being produced by your liver, it's generally safe. If insulin has to control the peak of your blood sugar chronically and excessively, that's a problem. So it really is physiologically, and as Gary said, it's a tiny, tiny increment in the bloodstream that affects harm. It affects uh, vascular harm and then by extension some of the ways that we remove that sugar from the bloodstream. But um, glucagon affects the lower end of the glucose spectrum in the blood. Insulin has to dampen the peak. Insula and that's a very small, it's called a glucose clamp, it's a very, very small amount. But I think the glucagon sugar control is the safe, healthy one. The chronic insulin control, where it's at the peak, is the dangerous one physiologically. As you know, I'm compassionate or, or very passionate about sugar being a drug, and it's the mental effects of the tranquility and that endorphin rush of sugar, which I believe is a completely separate subset. So, uh, you know, whether it's a developing baby, whether it's a pregnant mother, whether it's you or me, uh, the physiology, the pathophysiology comes from how that sugar is controlled and regulated in the bloodstream. And then on top of that, as somewhat of a separate element, you've got the endorphin effects that modify and modulate our behavior. Where, when I'm getting high on sugar, I don't need to go for a walk. I don't need to do those other things. So it becomes unifocal, dominant, and excessive. And I agree completely with you that the greatest high I get, the greatest rush you get, you can get a rush from codeine, but heroin gives you a much bigger, bigger rush. Not that I've done that. You get a much better rush from junk food than you do from a baked potato. But ultimately, the sugar content of both, depending on how they're consumed, is equally pathophysiologic for your body. I have... Um a very quick question. I have a family that has recently converted to keto, including four grandchildren. And my concern is that they're still a little finicky. And if there are any vitamins that would be recommended, any supplements that are not gummy bear, high fructose corn syrup crap that's out there, do you personally know of any vitamins for children? Liver. <laughs> <laughs> they're kids! I'm finicky! <laughs> Liver? <laughs> okay. Well, it may be a business idea for the young man that was looking for a keto idea. So. Pate. Pate. I can answer that for you when you have time. Okay. Thank you very, very, very much to the panel. They've been sitting up here for hours, as Gary said. Um, so, you guys can go. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just say thank you very much for Doug, to Doug for putting this whole show together. Uh, please give him a hand as well.